Welcome to Oz Seekers. Ricky here. I'm Michael. And Turk. And today we're going back to December the 1st, 1948. That's right, we'll be investigating the Somerton Man. Despite the many numerous investigations and special reports conducted on popular news and documentary channels like BuzzFeed and television shows like Today Tonight and 60 Minutes, mystery still surrounds the circumstances and the identity of the Somerton Man. On the 1st of September 1948 at 6.30am, South Australian police were contacted after the body of a man was discovered on Somerton Beach near Glenagh about 11 kilometres southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. The man was found lying in the sand with the back of his head resting against the seawall, his legs extended and his feet crossed. It was believed he had died while sleeping as there were no visible or superficial signs of struggle or foul play. An unlit cigarette was found on the right collar of his coat. A search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that may not have been used, a US manufactured narrow aluminium comb, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an Army Club cigarette packet which contained seven cigarettes of a different brand, Concetus, and a quarter-full box of Bryant and May matches. The case is considered one of Australia's most profound mysteries and there has been intense speculation ever since regarding the identity of the victim, the case of his death and also the events leading up to it. Public interest in the case remained significant for several reasons. The death occurred at a time of heightened international tensions following the beginning of the Cold War. The apparent involvement of the secret code, the possible use of an undetectable poison and the inability of authorities to identify the dead man. On June 14, 1949, the body of the unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery, where the Salvation Army conducted the service. The South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the man from a pauper's burial. Before burying the Summerton man, authorities embalmed his body and made a plaster cast of his face and upper torso. A discovery long after the man's body was found only added further intrigue to the bizarre scenario. The case was later dubbed Tamam Shud, after the Persian phrase Tamam Shud meaning ended or finished, which was printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap was torn from the final page of a copy of Ruboyat of Omar Khayyam, authored by 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Tamam was misspelt as Taman in many early reports, and this error has often been repeated, leading to confusion about the name in the media. But what about the phrase? Was it a code for something? Was it a hint about the man's origins or the region of the globe he came from? Or was it a random sentence with no real significance? Was the scrap piece of paper with the phrase deliberately placed on him by someone else? Following a public appeal by police, a copy of the Rabayat from which the page had been torn was located. A man came forward and showed police a 1941 edition of Edward Fitzgerald's 1859 translation of the Rabayat, published by Whitcomb and Tombs in Christchurch, New Zealand. Detective Sergeant Lionel Leone, who led to the internal investigation, protected the privacy of the man who found the book and referred him to using a pseudonym, Ronald Francis. It is understood that this man has never been officially identified. Francis had not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he had seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. Francis was not considered a suspect or found to have any involvement in the death of the Somerton man. Also on the rear cover of the enigmatic book was a code that to this day remains uncracked. A telephone number was also found in the back of the book belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Jo Thompson, who was born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Marrickville. Interestingly, she lived in Glenelg, about 400 metres north of the location where the Somerton man's body was found. When she was interviewed by police, 
Thompson said that she did not know the dead man or why he would have the, her phone number and choose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that at some time in late 1948, an identified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next door neighbour about her. Jerry Feltus, author of the book, The Unknown Man, about the Summerton Man mystery stated that when he had been interviewed Thompson in 2002, he had found that she was either being evasive or she just did not wish to talk about it. Feltus believed Thompson knew the Summerton Man's identity. Thompson's daughter Kate, in a television interview in 2014 with 60 Minutes, also said that she believed her mother knew the dead man. In 1949, Jessica Thompson requested that police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties, as it would be harmful to her reputation to be linked to the case. The police agreed, a decision that hampered later investigations. When she was shown the plaster bust of the dead man by Detective Sergeant Lean, Thompson said she could not identify the person depicted. According to Sergeant Lean, he described her reaction upon seeing the cast as completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. In an interview many years later, Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast and was present when Thompson viewed it, noted that after looking at the bus, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Thompson also said that while she was working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of the Rubaiyat. In 1945, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an army lieutenant named Alf Boxholm, who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. She said that she had received a letter from Boxholm and had replied, telling him that she was now married. Subsequent research suggests that she and Boxall did not remain in contact afterwards. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in July 1949, it was found in Sydney and the final page of his copy of the Rebayat was intact with the words Tamam Shud still in place. Boxall was now working in the maintenance section at the Randwick bus depot and was unaware of any link between the dead man and himself. Adding to the confusion of the Somerton man was a discovery of a suitcase. On 14 January 1949, staff at the Adelaide railway station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom after 11am on 30th of November 1948. It was believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. In the case were the following items, a red checked dressing gown, a size 7 red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pyjamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, a stenciling brush as used by third officers in merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange wax thread of unusual type not available in Australia. It was the same as that used to repair the lining in a pocket of the trousers the dead man was wearing. All identification marks on the clothes had been removed but police found the name T. Keen. On a tie, keen on a laundry bag, and keen without the last E on a singlet, along with three dry cleaning marks. 1171 slash 7, 4393 slash 7, and 3053 slash 7. Police believed that whoever removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items or purposely left the Keen tags on the clothes, knowing Keen was not the dead man's name. With wartime rationing still enforced, clothing was difficult to acquire at that time. 
Although it was very common practice to use name tags, it was also common when buying secondhand clothing to remove the tags of the previous owner. What was unusual was that there were no spare socks found in the case and no correspondence although the police found pencils and unused letter stationery. A search concluded that there was no T. Keen missing in any English-speaking country, and a nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks also proved fruitless. In fact, all that could be garnered from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat found in the case indicated it had been manufactured in the United States. The coat had not been imported, indicating the man had been to the United States or bought the coat from someone of a similar size who had been. Police checked incoming train records and believed the man had arrived at the Adelaide railway station by overnight train from either Melbourne, Sydney or Port Augusta. They speculated he had showered and shaved at the adjacent city baths before returning to the train station to purchase a ticket for the 10.50am train to Henley Beach which, for whatever reason, he missed or did not catch. He immediately checked his suitcase at the station cloakroom before leaving the station and catching a city bus to Glenelg. Although named City Baths, the centre was not a public bathing facility, but a public swimming pool. The railway station bathing facilities were adjacent to the station cloakroom, which itself was adjacent to the station's southern exit onto North Terrace. The city baths on King William Street were accessed from the station's northern exit via a laneway. There is no record of the station's bathroom facilities being unavailable on the day he arrived. On the poison theory, Cedric Stanton Hicks, Professor of Physiology and Pharmacology at the University of Adelaide, testified that of the group of drugs, variants of a drug in that group he called number one, and in the particular number two were extremely toxic in a relatively small oral dose that would have been extremely difficult if not impossible to identify even if it had been suspected in the first instance. He gave the coroner a piece of paper with the names of two drugs which was entered as Exhibit C. The names were not released to the public until the 1980s as at the time they were quite easily prescribable by the ordinary individual from the chemist without the need to give a reason for the purchase. The drugs were later publicly identified as Digitals and Ulbane, both of which are cardinaloid type cardiac glucosides. He noted that the only fact not found in relation to the body was evidence of vomiting. He then stated its absence was not unknown, but that he could not make a frank conclusion without it. Hicks stated that if death had occurred seven hours after the man was last seen to move, it would imply a massive dose that could still have been undetectable. It was noted that the movement seen by witnesses at 7pm could have been the last convulsion preceding death. Early in the inquiry, Cleland stated, I would be prepared to find that he died from poison, that the poison was probably a glucoside and that it was not accidentally administered, but I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person. Despite these findings, he could not determine the cause of death of the Somerton man. Cleland remarked that if the body had been carried to its final resting place then, all the difficulties would disappear. The lack of success in determining the identity and cause of death of the Somerton man had led authorities to call it an unparalleled mystery and believe that the cause of death might never be known. Alright guys, that was the Somerton man. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell. From the Oz Seeker crew, I'm Michael, that's Turk and Ricky. Ricky? <laughs>